So, hello everyone. I'm here. <laughs> hello. <laughs> All right, so I towards the global system science, from baboons to people. The problems of the world are really complex. We are confronted with climate change, with the financial crisis, and with war, and also the spreading of diseases and many more problems. And many of these problems are actually of a global scale because we have networked the world, and so really we need to have global answers to this. And that's why we need to have a global system science. My nature paper about global network risk actually is addressing this issue. And so what it basically says that we need to address tightly connected systems because we don't understand well enough how they work, how we can control them. In many cases, they have become actually quite uncontrollable. We need all together to develop an interaction and network-oriented view of the world. I mean, not just we, but everyone. So we have to explain these things to people out there, like business people, politicians, and so on, because they're supposed to take decisions, and we need to inform them. We also need to understand that information technology is creating a digital revolution, and so, that causes a co-evolution between information communication systems and society. And we certainly need a grand integration of knowledge over here. So that's basically the next step of complexity science, from a theoretical science oriented at some specific problems towards a science of really grand and interacting problems. Now, I'll present you a few components of such a possible global system science. Let's start with opinion formation. So, of course people have come up with models for opinion formation, and in many cases uh, they basically assume spin systems would uh, describe our opinion formation pretty well, so if we have kind of yes-no or pro-contra kind of situations and need to take binary decisions, then it's natural to assume spin models would do the job. However, of course, we should do experiments because there are quite a few spin models uh, that claim to explain opinion information. So, which one is really true? Now, is there any model that's actually good enough to describe this kind of behavior? Besides this, of course, we also have continuous opinion information problems, where there is a scale, say, from minus 1 to 1, or from 0 to 1, and the question is, what's happening there? And in fact, we made an experiment that was published in PMAS, where people had to guess the right answer to a question, and in this case, the right answer was 200, as you can see over here, and uh, what you can also see is that people were guessing five times altogether and we gave them information about the guesses of the other people. So as a result of that you see something like a convergence process going on. But also uh, it turns out that kind of the average of all the answers given starts to deviate from the true answer. So the wisdom of crowds is undermined by this feedback effect by social interaction. This is something that we need to take into account. So people influence each other, often described by imitation. And then the question is, why don't we all agree on the same answers? And because we influence each other all the time, there should be a convergence process. In fact, uh, many opinion information models would produce such a convergence effect if we wouldn't make particular assumptions such as bounded confidence where it's assumed that we influence people only if they are close enough in their opinion. But if you add a little bit of noise it turns out then suddenly what uh, happens to produce some diversity as you can see over here ends up again in convergence or if noise is large then you wouldn't find any pattern at all. 
So how can we understand actually that there is convergence on the one hand and diversity on the other hand? And in fact, um, there are models that can do this, um, and it's important here to consider the interaction of uh, social influence that we assume to be infinite but decaying with distance among opinions and <coughs> noise, noise that can create individualization that means that everyone agrees and now maybe you want to be special and uh, so that makes this cluster split up and in fact uh, these kind of curves look not so different from what you can see actually in newspapers uh, when it comes to um, election forecasts and uh, votes for different parties. The phenomenon altogether has some similarity actually with physics, namely droplet formation, where you can also see the split up into uh, different clusters. There is another problem that people are concerned about, which is the link between micro behavior and macro outcomes, say on a societal level. And in fact, uh, since a long time, at least uh, actually since Durkheim, um, and of course, he was uh, born much earlier uh, than this. This is just a, a book that basically references his work. Um, he said the whole is not just the sum of its parts, it's different, it has properties different uh, from the part that composes it. And of course, a complexity scientist uh, knows that he is talking here about emergence, but at the time of Durkheim, of course, there were no mathematical models, no computer simulations to understand that kind of emergence. Anyway, let's look into an experiment that we've made. And there is a surprise over here. So it's a very simple system, people interact just with their neighbors, and there are two kinds of people over here. Uh, that prefer different kinds of opinions. So basically doing what they like gives them some payoff, but also conforming with the behavior of their neighbors gives them some payoff. And then the question is, what are they doing in the end? So there is a so-called best response model, which basically optimizes the behavior based on what all the other neighbors have done in the past time step. And this best response model predicts 96% of all decisions. I mean, this is just amazing for a model of social decision making, you know, unheard of almost. But still, it turns out that this very accurate model is not capable of predicting the macro outcome. So, this is what the deterministic model says, you know, this best response model. This is actually what happens in the experiments. And so, um, the reason actually for this deviation between predictions of this deterministic model and the macro outcome is that we are faced here with an unstable system where the slightest deviation actually would lead to a completely different outcome. And so, a slight deviation like over here would actually or create an amplification and cascade effect in the end to get something completely different from what you expect. So the interesting thing here is that if we add noise to the micro model, to this deterministic best response model, you know, and it makes this model less accurate on the micro level, this model becomes more accurate on the macro level because it takes into account this instability of the system. Uh, that the <coughs> system is sensitive to small perturbations. So uh, this is also very important actually when we talk about mass surveillance and so on. You know, this idea that if we knew everything about you and how you behave, um, this would allow us to predict the future of society. No, this is not the case. Okay, so let's look into some real problems that we face with. And one of these problems, actually, since the origin of humankind, of society, is how to create coordination and cooperation between many people. Uh, people are not like ants, you know, we are different. Uh, and being different actually has a purpose um, 
it creates innovation, it creates collective intelligence, and many other important things for society. It increases resilience too. But we are faced with problems uh, such as <coughs> the tragedies of the commons. Yeah? And uh, one example is environmental exploitation. You can see it on the left over here. Then another example is environmental pollution or overfishing. And so the question is, how can we fix these problems? Now, usually people use game theory in order to come up with models to understand what's going on. And they start with a coordination problem. Here, the two pedestrians have want to get around each other, so they're moving in opposite directions, and they can go either right or left. So they have basically two options, two behaviors to choose from. And then if we have two pedestrians, there are basically four possibilities. Uh, if they both go to the left, to the left, um, then they succeed evading each other. So that creates a benefit. If one goes to the left and the other one goes to the right, then they're still standing in front of each other. They didn't succeed and there is a payoff of zero. Right? And so this defines as a payoff matrix, which is typical for the coordination game. And uh, then there are some equations actually describing how the frequency of these behaviors change over time. It's a so-called replicator equation. For the particular case of a coordination game, this is what you find over here. And then, of course, the physicist would uh, look into the stationary solution, so it would set this to zero. It turns out that there are three stationary solutions, P equals one half, P equals one, P equals zero. So basically a 50-50 situation, 50% 50 of people go to the left, 50% go to the right, or everyone goes to the right, or everyone goes to the left. These are the three stationary solutions. Next thing a physicist does is look into the stability of these stationary solutions and then it turns out that the 50-50 situation is actually unstable while the other two solutions are stable. And that basically means that if you start with a 50-50 situation, which is kind of the natural assumption as the initial condition in such a system, any small perturbation of this 50-50 situation would drive your system away into one of these other stable solutions. And that creates you a social convention. And that's actually the reason why we have a preference for the right-hand side in most countries in Europe. In Japan it's the left-hand side and uh, there's, there's not necessarily a direct correspondence to the side in which uh, cars drive actually. Now, we can actually insert other kinds of payoff matrices into the replicator equation as well. And one of the most interesting cases is what we call the prisoner's dilemma. It's a particular kind of social dilemma situation in which it's risky to cooperate and it's tempting to defect, that means to cheat others. And um, so basically, as you can see over here, if uh, both cooperate, it uh, creates a reward. This reward is actually quite high as compared to the situation where most people don't cooperate. Um, so they get a very low payoff over here called punishment. But if I cooperate and you don't, you would get a higher payoff than R called temptation. And I get a very low payoff, lower than P called sucker's payoff. You know, and that basically creates a temptation for you not to cooperate. And then once this happens, I would say, okay, I'm not stupid. You know, I'm not cooperating either. And as a result, we end up over here and that creates us a tragedy of the commons because both of us are in a bad situation. We get very little payoff. And so the question is, how can we shift the outcome of the system from here to there? To the cooperative solution. Now, what is important to know is that actually the neighborhood interaction are often supportive of cooperation. So, if you look at uh, a particular setting where people interact with neighbors in a ring, um, and then at some random additional links between people, I mean, we globalize in a sense. 
kind of we create shortcuts between people. And what happens is that if we increase the connectivity, actually we get a higher level of cooperation. So that's great. So why don't we go on networking? That will increase our, the cooperation even, even further, so we network even more. But then we get to this point where eventually you know, more networking means that actually this level of cooperation goes down. And this is a serious mechanism that's destabilizing the world right now. You wouldn't think so, of course that's quite surprising, but there's a mathematical theory that allows us to understand this. And in fact, some people, like Andy Haldane from the Bank of England, think that this has been the mechanism that has been destabilizing the financial system. So, as a result, we find cascade effects and the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers causes bankruptcies of other banks, you know, actually hundreds of banks, and that causes lots of, of hundreds of billions. So this is not just a funny theoretical example, this is a very costly accident because we have created these financial systems in the wrong way. You know, there is a design issue, we haven't designed it the right way, and it requires complexity scientists like you to fix it. Because if the system is wrongly designed, a single local perturbation is capable of messing up the entire system <laughs> and affect the entire world. Now, as we have seen that in the financial crisis, I mean, basically, there is no country that's really in a truly stable situation, right? And here is another example of flash crashes. You know, within minutes, uh, actually. Six hundred billion dollars evaporated from the markets, and people lost trust. It was kind of a chain reaction of automated trades. And had that happened on Friday afternoon, you know, almost five o'clock or so, that could have been the end of the financial system. Fortunately, the system recovered in a few minutes. And then, of course, people are asking, you know, what was the reason for this? Was it just a uh, genius um, crime act that made somebody a multi-billionaire it took six months to actually figure out what really happened and it turns out that there was a cascade effect and of course algorithmic trading was actually jumping in and uh, you know, everyone started selling stocks and that turned solid assets into penny stocks within minutes that means it also means that your company was owned by completely different people and companies after this event. So what can we do? Well, basically, these kind of systems need to have engineered great reforms, as we have it at home. You know, everyone actually has such a system at home because that saves your apartment from burning down if you have a local overload. So the question is, why did we engineer financial systems in this way? And how would we have to do that in the first place? So, you know, this is really one of the questions that you should work on. Try to figure out mechanisms that would make the financial system more stable. Because the financial instability can destroy our societies. You know, it's, uh, we are now getting into this regime of political and social instability. We see that in Greece, but in many other countries too. And this is very dangerous for our society. Okay, but also, since thousands of years, people came up uh, with mechanisms to support cooperation. And uh, one of the first mechanisms was actually kin selection or genetic favoritism. And to some extent, we have that until today. So inheritance law, for example. But in some countries, still, clans are a very important way of organizing society, but it comes with side effects, you know, such as, for example, um, blood revenge or ethnic conflict and so on. So eventually people came up with better mechanisms uh, to support cooperation. One of them is direct reciprocity, you know, I help you, you help me. So repeated interaction uh, supports such kind of direct reciprocity and that actually promotes cooperation. 
Then there's also indirect reciprocity, which is maybe the next step. And that basically means that uh, I help you, you help somebody else, and somebody else helps me. And uh, one system that's supporting such kind of interaction is um, reputation. So that's why reputation systems are actually spreading on the internet. But there are other mechanisms too, such as peer punishment, uh, which is the basis of the establishment of social norms. And full punishment, basically we pay for police and courts and so on. So, in conclusion of this, we can say that there are different mechanisms that allow us to transform a prisoner's dilemma into another kind of game. So, these mechanisms are game changes, if you, uh, if you want, like kin selection, direct reciprocity, and so on. And depending on the mechanism, you end up with different kinds of games. There could be state kind of games that allow for by stability or harmony games where everyone would automatically cooperate or snowdrift games where cooperation and defection could coexist. Now this is again interesting if you have a, a multi-population setting, so I mean a multicultural uh, um, setting and we will come back to this later on. Now we've also worked on some new mechanisms recently and one of them is a merit-based mechanism. So what we would do over here is match those people who were particularly cooperative with other people who were particularly cooperative. And that's not only creating benefits for cooperative people, but it's also creating a drift towards more cooperation. That means, as we've also shown experimentally, by the way, this is very strongly supporting cooperation. A further mechanism that has uh, supported effect is actually competition. So if you have two teams of people who compete to succeed, then basically each of them will make a harder effort and show more cooperation. Here again is another system. And uh, what we're looking here is the at a public goods game with four different strategies. So we, we have cooperators and defectors as before, but cooperators could now punish defectors you know, at some cost. And we would have also um, defectors who punish other defectors. So the, um, the cooperators who punish could be called moralists, and the, the defectors who punish could be called immoralists. Um, and so, the question is what happens in that setting? Now, if everyone interacts with everyone else, then the regular Cantor equation predicts that we'll end up actually with a tragedy of the commons again. The interesting point is if people interact just with their neighbors, then we find a very different outcome. And it turns out uh, that actually we see these clusters of similar behaviors, so birds of a feather flock together, it's called homophily, and that separates actually cooperators from moralists, uh, which is very important because uh, you know, moralists couldn't survive competition with cooperators because they pay this extra punishment cost. So they don't spread because uh, they have a disadvantage. And However, if now cooperators have to compete with defectors, then of course defectors are crowding out the cooperators uh, because defectors just don't pay your contribution and cooperators do, so no, defectors are in a better situation. So blue disappears, but green spreads because the moralists manage to punish uh, the defectors and so we end up with that situation over here. If you look at the computer simulation of this, then in the beginning you would think uh, the factories are taking over the world, but after a short time here it actually turns out that things develop very differently and that's one of the reasons why actually moral behavior could come into existence. Another important mechanism is success-driven Migration. So, if people not only imitate more successful behaviors of neighbors, but also can move to other places in a certain radius around them, 
and they would uh, tend to choose places that promise a particular high payoff, then this actually supports cooperation. But then the question, and what happens is people sometimes make mistakes and do the opposite of what they are supposed to do, and then it turns out that, uh, again, defection would be over, which is represented by red, and uh, as a consequence, we end up with a tragedy of the commons, as predicted for these kind of games, right? So, we start with heaven on earth, we end with hell on earth. Same thing if we have random relocations. So people move to other places, and you can see not only does it break up this cluster, but also we end up with a lot of defection in the system. So the question is, what happens if you have an imitation of better performing neighbors plus these two kind of very disruptive noises? And I asked that to my PhD student, Benjamin Yu, and she said, no, I think nothing interesting will come out there. <laughs> and so t two weeks later, I came back to his office and asked him, have you done this simulation? What did you find? That, yeah, we don't even need to do this because it's not going to create interesting results. So, so I really had to take my chair and say, no, sit down, <laughs> try it now. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. And then we started to, to run the simulation. We started with uh, defection only, that means really hell on earth, very bad situation. And uh, he was right for 10 minutes. So this is what happened. So defection only, very bad. And then, you know, sometimes people do the opposite of what they're expected to do, which is blue. And then it takes actually a very long time, actually in this case more than 25,000 iterations, until you have by accident, by coincidence, a super critical cooperative cluster. And once this is there, cooperation starts to thrive and it's spreading all over the world quickly. So this is quite amazing and doesn't require a particular random number to initialize this. It always happens, it just takes some time. And in fact, we have similar kind of phenomena in physics. This is an undercooled fluid and we just need to snip at this bubble and what was fluid before turns into ice, right? In this case, I would correspond actually to cooperation. Okay, so um, that's very interesting to see in a computer simulation, but some people would say, okay, this is just a simulation, so what happens in reality? In particular, actually, um, Ernst Fehr, you know, this very famous economist, said, I don't believe that at all. And then we started the cooperation with uh, two of his team members, Charles Atherton and Sonia Vogt, and did an experiment. And they also didn't believe that we would find cooperation in this kind of system. And these are the results we got. So, you know, mobility can really increase payoff, and that's actually why it uh, creates cooperation. So this has just been published recently, um, and this is pretty surprising for many people. Now, but we can go a step further. So people have been working for a long time to understand cooperation in these kind of social uh, dilemma situations. Uh, but the question is, do people have social preferences even? That means, do they want to be friendly to other people? And this is what economists usually deny. <coughs> So what we've done is basically simulate the evolution of the Homo economicus, which is kind of the standard model in economics. And uh, so the assumptions were as follows. Um, agents were assumed to decide according to a best response rule that strictly maximizes the utility function given the behaviors of the interaction partners. So this is kind of standard economic model, right? Now, the utility function, however, considers not only the own payoff, but allows to give a certain way to the payoff of interaction partners. However, this parameter that we call friendliness was set to zero 
in the beginning, so everyone was unfriendly, everyone was a homo economic, was just thinking of their own community. Now, friendliness was then treated as a trait that would uh, be biologically inherited, so either genetically or by education, to offspring. And the likelihood to have an offspring, however, increases exclusively with the own payoff, that means not the utility function. Yeah? It doesn't matter whether you're friendly to others or not. The only thing that, happens, uh, that matters is can you pay for food for your children? You know, can you pay for education? Can you, you know, contribute to their success? And so the payoff is assumed to be zero when a friendly agent is exploited by everyone else. And then if you don't have payoff, you don't have any children, that means somebody who's friendly but stupid, you know, basically has no offspring and disappears again. However, with there's mutation too, so the friendliness value actually tends to be that of the parent, but it could be slightly different. And we have assumed a mutation rate in a way that would not automatically cause a drift towards a 0.5 uh, friendliness value, right? So the expected value of friendliness was 0.2, but what we later on found in our computer simulation was a much higher value. So, even though none of these assumptions uh, would support cooperation or friendliness, uh, high levels of friendliness at least, we found some pretty surprising results in some parameter areas. So, for most parameters, however, we found the economic, homo economicus, as economists have assumed for ages. So, they were that bad in terms of their assumption. But there is a corner over here where a homo socialis results who is other regarding, who is friendly, and uh, who has social preferences. And that happens actually when offsprings are born next to their parents. Yeah? So we have local reproduction as it actually happens. This is what humans do, you know. And actually, there is a very important finding for humans is that children are usually raised for you know, about 20 years with their parents. So this is special. And that might matter actually for the way so. So surprisingly, evolution has made many of us out of regarding, and that might be the reason for the superior position that we have in the animal kingdom, most people think. Okay? And now, here is actually a curve that shows things as a function of time. So what you can see is that after quite a few generations, you find a sudden outbreak of friendliness and cooperation. And that also changes the situation where cooperators uh, initially have less payoff than detectors to a situation where they have more payoff. So, you know, that it makes them more successful because they now manage to overcome the tragedy of the commons. So, on average, they earn more because they avoid this trap of defection. If we look at the distribution of friendliness, then, as I said, everyone starts unfriendly in our simulation, but after sufficiently many generations, we find a broad distribution of friendliness values, and this is actually what we find in experiments too. So these are results of a colleague of mine, Ryan Murphy, and as you can see over here, there are some people who decide in a selfish way, but most people actually have more or less a pro-social tendency. And that is actually known since a long time, because Adam Smith himself said, however selfish men may be supposed, there are evidently some principles in his nature which interest him in, in the fortune of others and render their happiness necessary to him, though he derives nothing from it. And of course, this very thing needs to be reflected by economic theory. Now finally, I claim we start to have an economic theory that reflects this fact, which is the theory of homo economicus that surprisingly results in an evolutionary way by competition. Right? While evolutionary competition was sought to eliminate social behavior sooner or later. 
I think for the sake of time, I'm skipping this uh, simulation, but you find it on the web in our YouTube channel. And here you find a number of snapshots. We've done a simulation for two populations actually. And so we find not only this evolution of social preference, but also the evolution of cooperation among strangers, something that has been of very great interest too. So this is just a matter of time until that happens too. So I personally believe, among many other colleagues in the meantime, that we need a new economic thinking. And so besides this economics 1.0, as I call it, based on the home economicus, uh, assuming self-regarding behavior, we need to develop an economic theory 2.0 that considers other regarding behavior by homo socialis. And actually, of course, economists are aware of the fact that people not always behave exactly like homo economicus, but usually what they assume is, okay, somebody behaves like this and somebody else like this, but on average, it's all right. I think this is totally flawed. There is another stable solution, which is homo socialis, and that's in a very different place. And so we need to have a different theory. When homo economicus largely decides in an independent way, and so for this reason, the assumption of statistical independence of decisions is often made, and we can apply standard econometric methods. But once all our decisions depend on the impact our decision has on other people, you know, this becomes a network decision-making. I call it network minds. And that creates complex dynamics and requires a completely different kind of description. In particular, it requires complexity science. So, it's wrong to assume that other regarding preferences would not change rational choice theory. But we can extend this theory to consider complex dynamic resulting from this network decision making. Now we can go a step further and ask, okay, what happens when people have different preferences? Because this is actually what we find. You know, some people have, for example, equity preferences, others have equality preferences. So some people think people should get a salary proportional to the effort they made, and others think that everyone should get the same level of salary. Just to give an example, you know, some people think uh, one should uh, believe in this God and others believe one should believe in that God and so on. So, what happens if we have people with different preferences? This is what we looked at in this computer simulation over here, where basically there is a reward for showing the preferred behavior and the reward for, of conforming with the behavior of interaction partners. And it turns out, depending on the relationship between these values, you could have either a situation where everyone does what they like, or a situation where one population sets a norm, establishes the same behavior in the population, which means that a part of the people would have to adjust to a behavior that co doesn't correspond to their preferences. And of course that depends on the population size in particular, but not only, it also depends on the initial condition and other things. And in fact, this is again a predictive theory in the sense that we can find these different outcomes in the lab, in the experiments that we have done. So this is a case where everyone does what he likes, uh, called anomie in sociology, and this is a case where a social norm is formed. Now, of course, we can have other kinds of payoff matrices too in multi-population settings. And so, if we look at the different games that I mentioned before, I mean, Stack Han, Christmas Dilemma, Snow Drift, and Harmony game, that we find an amazing variety of different outcomes. And all these things are found in our society. And this includes also conflict and revolutions. So we can better understand actually why conflict results. And uh, this is obviously a very important subject, not only in Iraq, so these are data about Iraq, but also in the Middle East. 
such as the contested city of Jerusalem, and it turns out that there is actually a correlation between violent events on both sides, like uh, Palestinians and Jews. And, uh, and actually, our interpretation of the situation is that everyone is actually trying to establish social norms according to their culture, but if you have two cultures with different norms, you would punish people for doing something that they consider right. And as a result, they basically strike back and say, you don't do this again now, because we'll have to pay, pay a high price for this. So everyone tries to make others stop punishing. And as a result, however, what we find is an escalation of the situation. So punishment is not the right way of establishing social norms in a multicultural setting. But computer simulations based on data about this kind of conflict can inform us actually about potential solutions. So we can look into counterfactuals, different kind of political scenarios and what would be possible implications of these solutions on the level of conflict and where it happens. So I think at this point it's a good moment to stop and actually uh, be open for discussion and questions. So, thank you very much for your interest. And tomorrow, I'm going to talk about a time to learn system that allows us to measure a lot of the things that we'd like to learn about humans.